Good morning, Emmanuel United Church of Christ and friends. I am Dr. Jimmy Watson. We have a wonderful worship experience prepared for you this morning. However, before we begin, I want to share something exciting and interesting with you. As you may know, a few years ago, thanks to my wife, Annie, Don Maurice, and Carolyn Rock, we produced a picture wall back in the narthex of the sanctuary with all 12 pastors in the history of Emmanuel featured on the wall, except one. And first, we were not able to find a picture of our second pastor, Reverend William, uh, Wilhelm Carbeck. His dates uh, as pastor here are 1892 to 1900. Recently, however, Linda Maurice helped us locate and reach out to the granddaughter-in-law of Reverend Carbeck, who sent us the only known picture of him that you see now on your screen. What a wonderful legacy these former pastors have left behind for us to enjoy. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It's like a summer rain which restores the parched earth. It's like a cool breeze at the shore of a lake, at the top of a mountain, or through a crowded city street. God meets us here. We have gathered together or scattered to worship the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives. Let us pray. Maker of our days, you created each of us unique beings with differing strengths and weaknesses. Help us not only to use our strengths to assist others, but also to allow others to use their strengths to meet our weaknesses. Restore of our souls. You have seen the parched places we have made in our lives, along with the devastation thrust upon us by the action or inaction of others. Meet us in the places of our deepest pain so that our facades of self-sufficiency might fall away and we might be drawn into right relationship with you and with one another. Breath of our lives, without you we are but a mound of clay. Fill us with your presence. Invigorate our worship. Set us on fire so that others might be drawn into your light and nurtured by the warmth of your loving care. Amen.
Good morning, Emmanuel family. Uh, today's reading from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15, um, continues the story of Joseph following his betrayal by his brothers and uh, being sold into slavery. And he had done very well for himself in the land of Egypt. And his brothers come back to Egypt looking for help during a famine. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I'm your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine had been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He had made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children as well as your flocks, your herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This ends the reading. Good morning, everyone. Who's a loved child of God? In today's Bible lesson, Joseph had a choice. He could either choose to punish his brothers for what they had done to him, or he could forgive them and reunite with them. Joseph chose forgiveness, and God wants us to forgive others. Lemons right here are like jealousy and anger. Ooh, that was bitter. Like the bitterness we feel when we don't forgive. The second lemon, I'm gonna dip in sugar. The second lemon was sweet, like the sweetness we feel when we forgive others. God chooses to forgive us when we ask. God wants us to follow Joseph's example of sweet forgiveness and forgiving others. Let us pray. God, thank you for forgiving us. Please help us remember Joseph and find the strength to forgive people who wrong us. See you next week. Good morning, Emmanuel family. This is the time of the service where we bring our joys and concerns. Remember the sharing of our stories is the mortar that keeps our beautiful Emmanuel family together. We do have a joy this week, a big shout out to the Winterbergs, Derek and Lynn, for a very successful youth Zoom game night. It looked like it was lots of fun and we appreciate the hard work that you're doing for our Sunday school children and our youth. We do have a lot of concerns this week. 
please pray for the Claysings, Sam Valenti, the Vortmeyers, Mary Ellen Dominic, Nancy Berryman, Sue Schuster, and Dee Schuster. Also, let us pray for all those who are isolated at home or in nursing facilities. Let us gather with this prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is thy kingdom, and thy power, and thy glory forever. Amen. Let me close with this. Spirit of life, known to us in beginnings and endings, in possibility and promises, we give thanks for all that has led to this moment and all that is yet to come. May the words we speak and the dreams we share and the faith we renew this morning give us wisdom give us comfort and give us courage for all the days ahead. For the way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high during these challenging <coughs> times. May you continue to wash your hands, stay safe, and wear a mask. We love you. A reading from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. Then he, Jesus, called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Amen.
Are there any picky eaters out there? Yourself? Someone in your family? How about your dog or your cat? My little Yorkie puppy is a very picky eater. I try to give him the same kind of dog food every day because everyone tells me don't change his diet. And some days he will eat virtually everything that I put in front of him and other days he will rebuff almost everything that I put in front of him. And if I did not know better, I would think that he is doing this on purpose. He's also already a professional beggar. He will bark incessantly until you throw him a crumb, which I know defeats the purpose of trying to keep his diet consistent. When a crumb hits the floor, intentionally or not, his young ears will hear it drop from across the room and he will descend upon that crumb faster than my ancient body can bend over to pick it up. It's interesting how he can be picky when it comes to what I put in his dog bowl, but when it comes to crumbs, he's not picky at all. He will put anything in his mouth. Kind of reminds me of people who are so desperate for food, they will go what we call dumpster diving. Crumb eaters are never picky. As the old saying goes, beggars can't be choosers. This is not a time to be very picky, is it? I mean, there seems to be more empty shelves than usual at the grocery store. I keep hearing that we are heading for a food shortage, which is related, of course, to a, a crippled economy. Of course, compared to other countries and other eras in human history, we have really not much to complain about so far. And yet there might come a day when we cannot buy all the food items we want or need. This is not a time to be picky in terms of our religious faith either. Since the pandemic began, we have had to go on a spiritual diet, have we not? Although many of us have adapted to our spiritual diets to make sure we are being fed sufficiently, the meals we are receiving are different. Sunday morning worship is not what it used to be. In gathering uh, or in-person gatherings are only once a month and most of you have chosen so far not to make that part of your diet. Sunday school, Monday night, study group, Wednesday morning, prayer and share, interfaith dialogue, denominational meetings, etc. They do not taste the same when we are doing these things on Zoom, if we're doing them at all. And I don't know about you, but some days it feels like we are eating spiritual crumbs. And I think there's a lesson to learn here. Because of our situation, today. We need to learn to set aside our spiritual pickiness, at least for now. We need to learn to be flexible and open to new ways of doing things. And if we can do that, continue to do that, then we will benefit from not being picky, at least until normality returns. And this is the lesson we can learn from the Canaanite woman in our gospel reading today from Matthew chapter 15. Before I get to her, however, let's back up and put her story in context. Before we meet this unnamed Canaanite woman, or rather before Jesus meets her and responds to her in a way that makes us uncomfortable, Jesus is in a teaching moment. Because apparently some religious elites, namely Pharisees, have been criticizing Jesus and his followers for their actual diet and their lack of hand washing. I guess they were being hand wash shamed. Presumably they have been eating food that is what we call non-kosher. Well, never at a loss for words or a comeback, Jesus sarcastically responds, 
You know, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles. In other words, because of their laws and customs, not for health reasons, the religious elites were too worried about what people eat and whether they wash their hands. Jesus explains that what they eat will come out in the sewer. Even if they eat an unclean animal, it will not stay in their bodies. So turning their picky laws upside down, Jesus suggests that eating the wrong food or not washing hands is not really what defiles a person. What defiles a person, according to Jesus, is our evil thoughts, motives, intentions, actions, things that come from deep inside of us, our hearts. I get the sense that Jesus is really upset with the religious elites who are criticizing him and his followers. I imagine him speaking with a flushed red face and visibly bulging veins in his neck. He's that angry. And so he leaves that place feeling a bit chastised and travels to a place where he will not have to worry about Pharisees and other picky, legalistic religious leaders giving him a hard time about his more relaxed lifestyle. So he goes to a Gentile territory, namely Tyre and Sidon. Word gets around that he is there, which excites even the non-Jewish community. And this is when he meets the unnamed Canaanite woman. Now Canaanite here means that she is a member of the indigenous, that is the original population. Think Native American. Now like most people in that time and place, place, she believes that her ailing daughter is being tormented by a demon. She also knows her Judaism enough, or well enough, to refer to Jesus as a son of David, which could be applied to any Jewish male. She is probably aware either um, of his reputation as a healer, or even the rumor that he is the long-awaited Messiah. And so she cries out to him for mercy and, and to help with, uh, for her ailing daughter. I mean, beggars can't be choosers, right? At this point, I'm going to suggest that Jesus is still in a rotten mood from his previous encounter and criticism from the religious elites. The disciples, Jesus' entourage, do not help either because they ask Jesus to send her on her way. And at first, the moody Jesus obliges them and dismisses her saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Apparently, up until this point in his life and ministry, Jesus had not had e enough of an expanded interfaith spiritual diet. But the Canaanite woman persists. She blocks his path, kneels in front of him, and pleads for help. And so Jesus does what most embarrassed people do. He doubles down. He says, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Here, Jesus is not only crabby, he's insulting. To refer to someone as a dog was worse then than it is today. Uh, when we refer to someone, especially a woman, as a dog. Now perhaps she is used to this, living so close in proximity, geographical proximity, to other sons of David. And like many other members of an oppressed and degraded minority, she has learned to own the label, using it to her advantage. So she decides to school Jesus, take him to task. She says spontaneously and with wit and wisdom, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. 
The storyteller does not hesitate to let us know that not only does her daughter benefit from the crumbs from the master's table, but the tables have been turned. Jesus may have given her and her daughter some crumbs, but she gave Jesus a gourmet meal, a healthy portion of awareness for the plight of those who are not privileged House of Israel occupants. Do you think maybe her stinging words made him realize that he was going down the same picky road of religious elitism, legalism, and exclusivism that he had just witnessed in the stinging rebuke of the Pharisees? Regardless, the wit and wisdom of the Canaanite woman, unnamed and yet not unappreciated, is now blocking our path, kneeling in front of us and pleading with us to use this moment in history as an opportunity to shed our religious pickiness. She is here to remind us to be flexible, to think outside the box, outside these walls, to adapt to our new reality. She is here to tell us to allow our faith to override our fastidiousness and our spirituality to outshine our need to be a stickler for details. She is here, sisters and brothers, to share her crumbs with us. And for that, we are grateful. Amen. I want to again thank all of you for your generosity during this time. In times of plenty and want, God provides for our deepest needs. So give generously out of the abundance of God's blessings so that in these challenging times, God's work might continue. Let us pray. Holy God, you are our provider. We dedicate to your service our lives and these offerings from your blessing and our labor. Work in us and through us to extend your love and care here and around the world. Amen. You have been reconciled with Christ, so do the work of Christ in the world. Extend support to those in need. Speak up for those cast aside. Build bridges of reconciliation. Strengthen bonds of community, knowing that the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives will be with you this day and evermore. Amen.